All right, uh, good evening. Welcome to the latest installment of uh, Building the Scottish State. And I'm joined again by uh, MP Angus, Ang Angus McNeil. So uh, thank you for uh, being part of one of the first post-Brexit um, interviews. And so, uh, sir, first of all, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you very much for having me again. Yeah, uh, great pleasure uh, to be here. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's just get a little bit of rundown on the situation in Westminster. I mean, what's what's going on? I mean, if, 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 the, if the kind of the basis of it, I mean, you've got I, I, I saw you questioning Boris Johnson the other day about the lorry queues at, at Dover. And uh, and it just seems like I mean, you know, there's a there's already uh, shortages of some types of fruits and vegetables. And, you know, I don't I don't see it. How how, how do you see it? And, and what, what do you how do you see the Westminster system at this point? Yeah, I mean, that question was done uh, back in September um, and, you know, this was on the expectation of um, the projections people would make it and, you know, it, it wasn't great. Uh, it's still not good. Um, the lorry queues aren't as bad as perhaps was expected for the simple reason many of the lorries are staying away, uh, which is not a good thing. Um, yeah, and there's lesser, uh, not as many things coming to the UK. And more, more importantly for me at the moment, actually, in my constituency is... Uh, Scallop boats have had to tie up, prawn boats are tying up, um, and the whitefish price has cashed. Um, DFDS, who are the main hauliers of this uh, marine produce, uh, sea produce to the, the European continent, uh, have at least stalled for another five days before they can take anything out. So uh, things are becoming quite tight. Uh, we shall see uh, what will happen um, in times to come. But uh, already the Brexit paperwork has been, is very challenging. Uh, and that is causing huge difficulties. I think many people still get to grasp why that is. People are wanting that sorted out. The paperwork, of course, is a function of an international treaty between the European Union and the United Kingdom. Uh, some fishermen have said to me, well, Norway's getting in. But yeah, Norway's in the single market. The UK is in a situation, as Michael Gove put it, uh, before the Brexit vote. It would be ridiculous, I think. He said that the UK would be outside the single market, would be in a market stretching from... Um, Iceland to the Russian border. We won't be outside like uh, Russia and Belarus. Well, we're now outside like Russia and Belarus. Um, so that's creating huge difficulties for people and it's going to be very costly. Costly all the way down, but it's actually at the bottom of the chain is probably young people working in, in fish processing factories who are now down to maybe two hours a day and probably going to get less uh, very soon. But that's the price of the Brexit we didn't vote for. Yeah. Okay. And um, what, what is... Does there seem to be any sense of accountability on any of the ministers? I mean, you know, in terms of what's going on, or are they just saying it's uh, we said it all along, or it's not? Uh, what is it? Boris Johnson said it was a teething problem or something. The long low recuse. Is there is there any kind of recognition on their part of of what you know what what's happening and what they're what's you know? What, no, there, there, there's none at all. They're still on the Kool Aid. Um, the uh, as I think the Americans might say, uh, the. Uh, and the, the Brexiteers are still coming out with the usual poetry that we've now uh, freed uh, the UK from EU uh, bureaucracy and legislation and we can make trade deals across the world. And they say they've signed a staggering 72 or 68 trade deals, depending on its counting. But of course, they haven't. They've, done, they've managed to roll over some of the trade deals the EU had negotiated. Uh, they've got terms to agree, not always the best of terms in the case of Japan, certainly not as good as the EU's terms. Um, so they've got um, a sign over uh, of some of the deals, but they've no new deals at all. Meanwhile, they've walked out of the European market, customs union and single market, and uh, that's a 4.9% damage event to GDP. Um, and there's nothing, they've got nothing back in world trade deals. And I, think I might have said before, the best of the trade deals in terms of value would be the American trade deal, which is a quarter of the world's GDP. That's only going to give them an extra 0.2%. So that's about... 28 times less and then you know for the rest of the world to get maybe after that so you're not even going to make a percentage point it's just yeah. damage 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 but the question was about the guys at Westminster and they're as chirpy as ever I think they've done a great thing and the real world is somewhere else entirely they're on one of those other seven or eight planets that we'll have to trade with uh, to be as uh, uh, that we've got to find uh, as we're populated with Americans uh, to make up for the damage of Brexit because that's roughly what it is if you've uh, if, you've only, if you can only make 0.2% back with a quarter of the world's population, you're going to need about 28 quarters uh, <clears throat> to make up that 4.9%, which is a good seven planets worth of people. So 
Yeah, uh, and the, the numbers for the Brexiteers were never the strong point. What, what they much preferred was uh, a sort of a misty-eyed look back towards the empire and imagining that things could return to when they, they dictated both sides of trade arrangements. That's not the way the world works now. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 the, and with the incoming uh, Biden in, in administrations, uh, uh, unless there's a successful insurrection in the next few days, um, uh, uh, Biden does, uh, I think he's demonstrated quite a bit of hostility towards uh, Boris Johnson. And, there's, and uh, also he, he has state, clearly stated that there's no way that they'll get a trade deal if they jeopardize the Northern Irish uh, border situation. So that, that makes it even more problematic for them. Yeah, Biden. It was Biden who said his 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 head was in, his soul was in Scranton or something. His heart was in Ireland. Um, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> and just about everybody he hires is either McCarthy or Doyle or you know this Irish America has come to the fore. And Irish America, yeah, for many reasons, has not felt very warm uh, to to the UK. Another thing the UK doesn't probably fully understand is probably a lot of Irish America has been raised in stories of why their ancestors left. In famine and or difficult times. Exactly, and you and, and you can be sure that uh, uh, Biden and his family, you know, they have store, you know, family stories about how they, they know it. how they were expelled. You know, they they you know they they you know, they, they they definitely know know that part yeah, of history, you know, and, <laughs> and you know, for them, although an American trade deal is still small to the UK versus Brexit, um, still something. But for the USA. The UK is a real minnow. It's a tenth again. It's 0.02% of their GDP. How much effort does the Biden administration want to spend uh, going through Congress and the Senate on a trade deal that's worth 0.02% of GDP? He, he'll achieve that sort of growth uh, doing some sensible domestic policies uh, with probably a lot less congressional effort than he's going to might have with a, with a trade trade deal with the UK. So that will probably be weighing on their minds too. It's not quite the it's not quite the uh, situation it was uh, for the UK uh, a while ago. And just mentioning Ireland as well, it's interesting to see that Irish uh, politicians are talking about the consistent solidarity they find from other EU member states. And I, I bring this up just to highlight the fact that uh, Ireland's going to benefit from a fisheries uh, fund of about 1 billion and 51 million euros, uh, while Scotland and the UK will be sharing uh, a fund that the UK Prime Minister thinks is wonderful at about a hundred million pounds, so it'll be about a tenth of the of the figure uh, for Ireland. Except that's all over the UK, and for Ireland, it's for a, in amongst a population of four and a half million. For us, it's in amongst a population of sixty-six million. So we're effectively probably talking about one to five percent, depending on it's distributed amongst fisheries uh, on the of the compensation the Irish are going to get. And the Irish, of course, haven't lost their markets, and we have, and that's why our boats are tied up. And what what is uh, and what do you think uh, Brexit means? Legit. Uh, first of all, very quickly, I do see the picture, the the um, the uh, the questions coming in. We'll, we'll we'll get to those. We'll get to those later on. Uh, don't don't worry about it at this point. We'll, we'll okay. Get on. We'll, we'll get to, we'll get to them later. And um and how badly affected do you think Ireland is going to be by Brexit? Obviously, they've said that you know I mean it, it's it's not good for anybody, and they've done they've done their best to keep you know Britain you know as attached as possible uh, to the single market. Uh, but I mean, j- just in terms of trade, I mean, a-, a lot of trade, you know, t- between the EU and Ireland has has traditionally gone through, you know, go through Dover and you know over over the Irish over the Irish Sea. Um, I'm I'm just wondering, are you aware to what extent they plan for that and how they're kind of able to circumvent that uh, so that Ireland isn't too badly affected? Yeah, I mean, I think the the Irish have been actually given it more thought. Um, over the last number of years than the UK has, bizarrely. Uh, and I've tried to give it more mitigation than that, than the UK has. Um, as I said, it's 4.9% damage uh, to the UK economy. And the worst affected in the entire UK are the highlands and islands of Scotland. So you've seen an island of Vattersea actually behind me there from Barra. Uh, so this is the part of the world that's going to be the worst affected in all of Europe. I've got a feeling that the Irish damage is something... I mean, somebody can Google this and, and throw it in the chat if they want. I, I, Brexit GDP damage to Ireland, will probably find it. But I would have a feeling it's about probably about 1% of their GDP. Um, it won't be insignificant, but it won't be as significant as the UK's damage. They will have mitigation, um, and they've got their own difficulties, clearly, with... Uh, getting goods through the UK and getting goods backwards and forwards to the UK. Interestingly, they've got an increase in ferries going from Rosslare to Sherburn. And they had those ferries anyway, but there's an increased volume yeah, yeah. that way. It is longer. It's about, a, I think it's about an 18-hour journey. 
journey. If you leave at seven o'clock at night, you're there at one in the one in the afternoon. Um, it might be a little, two or three hours closer than that. It is slower than taking the, the land route um, across England and Wales uh, to Ireland, but it might actually end up being quicker uh, as a result of the barriers that the oh, okay. Okay. UK so the, so the, so currently so there's has. Reinforced, there's reinforced transport between uh, between, uh, between yes. as you say, Sugarborg and... Okay, I, I, I wasn't... Yeah, the, 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 the Irish have done that. One of the things the, the Irish apparently did or thought about was when the Icelandic volcano, Ayafjatla Jökull, uh, blew up a number of years ago, was they realised how heavily dependent they were on air transport. Um, and that probably stood them in good stead, that thinking, because they, they realised that they needed uh, more surface uh, to transport between themselves and the continent uh, in case of unforeseen events. Well, <laughs> the unforeseen event has, has come their way, but um, the unforeseen event now being Brexit and, and man-made trade problems, or, or yeah. London-made trade problems, or UK-made trade problems. Uh, so they've, they've thought of ways around that. But, you know, it's still not easy for them. It's still... Not the best of situations. It's not great for anybody when you start to raise uh, trade barriers. But uh, the smallest partner now is is the UK. Uh, Ireland is in with the big boys, uh, and that, that makes a difference. And as I said, um, the continued solidarity, or the consistent solidarity, actually, as the TD Neil Richmond of Fine Gael said, that the EU is shown is certainly far greater than any solidarity the UK has shown in Scotland. We voted, to no matter what we voted for, we got, we got told to do what they voted for. Um, that is not something that happens to any EU state. Um, and we're certainly not seeing the level of solidarity of putting our needs first uh, in the UK the way the Irish were for certainly a long while during this negotiation had their needs uh, first. And Barney, is, <coughs> Barney had Ireland uh, f- foremost in his mind. I think he was even speaking some Irish Gaelic at, sometimes, at some points, uh, which is, I don't think we're going to spot Boris Johnson speaking any any of the older languages of the UK, Welsh or Scottish Gaelic or even Cornish, but um, that's not in their monolingual worldview at all. Not at all, not at all. And uh, so, let, so I'd like to move on to the uh, the, the, the Plan B that, that you've uh, been so so much so, so much of an advocate of. Um, uh, let's see. So just walk us through. I mean, so j- just to begin with, of course, Plan A is that they get a you know a, 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 a search, Section Thirty order from Boris Johnson, and then they're able to hold a referendum, a la twenty fourteen. Uh, obviously, Boris has said as recently as the last few days that's not going to happen. Um, what's your plan B? And do you think that the SNP government has backed itself into a corner by insisting on Section 30? Although I think that I don't think I think Sturgeon has said from time to time that they w- wouldn't rule anything out. How do you how do you see the state of play at this point? Yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm just pulling up a tweet now and the sort of thing I've put forward uh, to the National Assembly of the SNP. Hopefully we get a chance to present it. I'm not overly sure what the format of National Assembly is, but you know, Plan B is something that's worth it's worth doing in this election. There is absolutely nothing to lose from doing it. Um, just just the, the headline is, if you give Plan B a shot, and okay, it doesn't work, the SNP is still going to win this election, uh, mm-hmm. short of an insurrection of some kind, uh, which, of course, uh, happens happens uh, these, these days. But, you know, we voted for a Section 30. Um, we voted for a referendum, and it's been blocked by the UK government. Now, the difficulty with Plan A is, and I'd, I'd like it to work, but Plan A asks the Scottish people, can we go and ask Boris Johnson a question to then hopefully come back and ask you a question? Um, and the problem with it, in that, right in the centre of that process, is Mr Boris Johnson. Now, Boris Johnson, from, the, from his own, uh, for his own reasons of self-interest, isn't going to give a, a Section 30. So I think everybody knows that. Uh, whether they're admitting it or not, um, you'd have to be quite stupid not to know it, really, because every time he's asked, I mean, Pete Wishart asked uh, this week, uh, I've asked in September, I've written in November, I responded to in December, the Scottish government wrote in January, I wrote in um, in November 2018, we responded to in December 2018, a year actually before the, the 12th of December, it was a year before the general election of 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been no, 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 probably, uh, all, all the way through. Uh, they haven't got to change their minds at that. Why would they? I mean, we've today got 18 opinion polls on the trot, 18 in a row. Uh, there are certain football teams would be delighted to have such a poll. But uh, uh, Scottish Independence has got 18 in a row uh, opinion polls supporting independence. Now, the way I'm seeing it is, I know it's no, 
um, from the Section 30. But if, you know, I don't have the authority to do this with the Scottish government, but I would, I'd argue with them and reason with them, um, is to say to Boris Johnson, you've got to the 31st of March to give us a Section 30, or else we'll use the election as a plebiscite. I'd also mm-hmm. investigate and know this before the 31st of March too. Uh, the sort of thing Martin Keating is doing, can the Scottish Parliament, uh, does it have the power to hold its own uh, referendum? Now, it may or may not have that power, and it probably doesn't unless you're particularly clever in the way you're having a consultative question that you're asking the people about. But then we have the legality and the, and the authority to make people man, or at least pay people to man polling stations, to count votes and to declare votes. Um, and that, that's, that itself is another issue. So the Section 30 is not going to happen. And there's nobody in the Scottish uh, government or in the SNP who can guarantee you that another form of referendum is going to happen in the next Scottish Parliament either, unfortunately. Um, so you may end up winning the election, having a good number of many seats, good enough for independence, in fact, if you use that as a mandate, but having chosen to go down particular routes, uh, and those routes being requiring a permission or subject to an axe, uh, from Westminster, you're going to find yourself choked. Now, you can't become independent without establishing the legitimacy from the people. Um, so, as I said, the Section 30 is dead, um, or effectively dead. There's nobody, we might go through the pantomime of saying it, but <laughs> nobody thinks it's going to happen. Um, and then the, um, you go to the Scottish Parliament, and if the Parliament passes a um, uh, referendum um, bill, it's probably going to go to the courts. If it's not going to the courts, you might have emergency legislation in the Westminster as it's coming through to say we're clarifying the powers of the Scottish Parliament and in no way, shape or form can you have a referendum at the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and therefore, you, you chop the legs from under it because this is what I would do if it was Boris Johnson. Come on. Uh, he's, <laughs> so we've got to think what he's going to do and, and, and try and stop it. And so that's what he would do. Um, logically, there's something he doesn't want and obviously he doesn't want this. The UK market is small enough after Brexit. I mean, there's, they haven't even got the... The Brexit market isn't entirely the, the entire UK. They've lost Northern Ireland. They've a trading block that's smaller than the UK. And it, you know, they're isolated enough to have an even smaller trading block. So they've they have loads of interests and loads of reasons for stopping Scottish independence. Um, so what are you left with? Well, the referendum routes, nobody can guarantee they're probably dead. The only guaranteed event coming up is the ballot box. Now, if you can establish, or if you can't establish by the 31st of March that any of those two referendum routes I mentioned are goers, mm-hmm. then I would say you say to the people at this election, if you vote for us in a majority, and we have a majority of MSPs who are going to vote in a vote soon after the election for independence to, to show that this has been the will of the Scottish people and that we have the legitimacy to do so, we're now heading on a mandate for independence. Now, some people say you can't show your hand, though. You've got to keep your cards close to your chest. Well, I've never, I never bought that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's maybe for very small micro-tactics. But for the big strategy and for mechanisms, you can't get a mandate for secrets. So if you don't have a mandate for it, my hunch is we'll get no referendum. Or if we have a referendum that goes to the courts, we'll be four years fighting about it. Uh, the 2026 election is going to be the 2021 election for slow learners. In the meantime, you let the UK that's rocking <laughs> yeah. at the moment regroup uh, come back stronger and better to thump you, as they did in 2014 with with all their successful lies and allies and everything else. Um, and why would you give them that opportunity? Instead, use May's election. Okay, let's say let's say you don't get all the seats. The SNP is still going to win the election. But I think the way the polls are looking, actually, as predicted about two years ago, there was a hard Brexit. The support is in the high 50%. It's stronger than the SNP support. You've nothing to lose. You've something to gain, SNP, by adopting this policy. And let's say, just let's say, you fall short. You're still going to win the election. And if you, you know, if it's successful, you win independence. It's such a win-win situation to go for it. Yeah. And I'm absolutely, you know. And as I said, I don't have the authority uh, to make this happen. I'm no magic wand. I can't force Nicola Sturgeon or anybody, John Swinney or Michael Russell or any of the ones in the Scottish government. Uh, to to listen to me and, and to and to do what I'm saying, but one thing I wouldn't do, I wouldn't shut my mouth about it. Uh, and if if they don't get it afterwards, I know, I'll take no pleasure in it. But I will bloody tell them I told you so. In the way I told them beforehand that having an, an election in December 2019 was letting Boris out of the cage, and uh, giving Boris uh, a majority to do what he wanted, and it blew up our strategy of 2019, which was the the I didn't, didn't agree with that either, incidentally. But however. I, I, reasonably silent about it, about the, the Brexit uh, referendum. 
you know, we've got to realize that, that we haven't been strategically bang on every time. You know, we've had we've had a positive, successful leader uh, in many ways who's uh, very popular amongst the people. But strategically, we ain't got it right every time. That's why we are where we are. And, you know, the big one, the Brexit that just happened, you know, talking about secret plans, Scotland wouldn't be taken out against its will. Actually, we were. And there was no secret plan. We were just out from the rest of the UK and now our fishermen are tied up. As I said in the beginning, so you know I'm laughing, but I'm exasperated in the laughing at the same time. But absolutely, absolutely. yeah, because uh, I, I may I think I mentioned this last time we we uh, we spoke, but my my friends and I, have, uh, some colleagues and I have d- d- developed this uh, blockchain digital covenant that uh, that that, uh, that where you you sign it, it's registered on the blockchain, and and, and if in theory if uh, we got 2.2 million signatures, uh, blockchain signatures, which would be completely validated. That would be a legal means to achieve uh, independence. It would it would need explaining to the international community, but it is a, a completely valid, accurate way of measuring popular support for d- dissolving the union. So it's a digital covenant. Dot Scott. You might be seeing me cringing here, Mark. Why is that? I haven't signed it yet. Oh well, sign it next time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but that, that, sign it. You know, and and the thing I is, know I agree with you, I, and I just got to do the blooming thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, but but the thing is, it, but but after we did this, I sent a letter to the Scottish Parliament and said, uh, you know, look, here here's a way of, you know, um, if you if you if the Scottish government says, okay, if we get two point two million signatures and and encourage people to sign it as a means to achieve independence, it could be done very very easily. You know, I mean, a popular mandate could be demonstrated within the coming months if there was a concerted effort on the on the side of the Scottish government to say, look, here's the route of independence. There's there's nothing wrong. You know, there's nothing illegal about sign, signing a petition yeah. and mm-hmm. having an. Absolute- you just got to establish the legitimacy and many countries have done it in different ways. Yes. So the problem in Scotland is some people have just alighted on the thought that we could only have a referendum. And it's, it, to, I think it's the first thing that they've, they've thought of, but it's actually not the first thing they thought of it. This is Alex Salmond's policy when he wanted to disentangle independence, which was low in popularity then, and trying to get the SNP elected to government. So he, he put right. in what he sort of felt a safety cordon between the two to get himself into power and then to establish that, you know, Scots could run uh, their own affairs and do it quite well. So, um, you know... It's different times now. We, we can go back to what was a policy before the 87 election, which is just a majority of SNP MPs. But you can't do that in secret. You're going to have to tell the people beforehand exactly. you're going to do it. Because uh, you can't say, bro, a surprise, you've given us a big one. And now that actually meant something that we didn't tell you about beforehand. That doesn't work. I know. It, and then as I, after I sent it to the, the Scottish Parliament, I, I mean, I, just, I heard through the grapevine that Mike Russell was kind of out, 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 outwardly hostile towards it. And... Uh, and, you know, just, uh, but this idea of a, but it, it was only proposing a, a, an alternate means to achieve uh, independence that could, yeah. as I said, me- measurably verify uh, support for independence. And as long as the, the Scottish government said, OK, we will declare independence once this threshold is achieved. I mean, what's the what's the problem? And then you go out and explain. Absolutely. This, and, and this is how we measured it. This is what we did here. Will you recognize us because we have. Because as you know, international law is silent on how independence is achieved. But it, you know, of course, to get international legitimacy, it needs you know, it needs to be peaceful, of course, and and uh, democratic, which this is both. But you know, I but the nobody talked. You know, very few people talked about it. Very few people have you know are, are aware of it. And so, and 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 above all, it's not seen. Everybody's questioning. Well, what if the Scottish government doesn't accept it? What if the you know? Oh, and because there hasn't been any said. Okay, yeah, yeah. Sign the covenant, and we'll we'll do it after this. But again, I ju- it, it just seems to me as if the Scottish government is in this bubble, and even just introducing new ideas like Plan B, there just seems to be this hostility towards it. Yeah, it's it's um, it would seem to be on that one. You know, even if even if that wasn't actually the one that. Triggered independence. The very act of getting, say, 1.8 onwards is what you need. 1.8 onwards million people to say they wanted independence. Um, then that would that would be a good exercise for them to go through. Because then, if you want to put those 1.8 million people to a ballot box, they were going to reinforce what they've done because they've already well, been psychologically we've, committed to this. So we've, you know, we've already seen it. We've already seen it as at the very least it can it can reinforce any kind of uh, in, yeah. you know it's never been in, it's never meant to be in competition with anything that the, the Scottish government is doing, only to reinforce it. And given the 
legal context, I don't, you know, I, I think it's one of the, you know, only alternatives that could, that could, you know, at least verify support for independence in the, in the coming, you know, in the coming future. But it just seems to me as if they're so dead set on this idea of a referendum, even though, you know, I mean, so there's no, I mean, the thing I keep telling people, you know, I don't think people hear or understand or comprehend or listen, there is no guarantee of a referendum in the next parliament. You know, in 2016, I don't remember when, this, when the SNP won and, you know, if we're taking it against their will and there'd been an independence referendum, I expected an independence referendum to happen. It's only about 2018 I realised this is actually slipping, this is, and now we're in 2021 and it obviously didn't happen and we did get taken out against their will and we didn't manage to mitigate that at all with independence. There is, again, no guarantee in the next parliament that independence can happen. And, you know, the ballot box event that we might use for independence Unfortunately, although I will argue against it, it is sort of uh, mathematically impossible, if you like, as I say in sports. Um, I will argue that we use May 2021. We've got to remember, we've we've got, we've got people that are getting really annoyed with this, the situation in the UK. I mean, if, if fishermen need to be, the, under, you know, the, the fishermen, when they understand fully the consequences of being tied up, all of them, some of them do, uh, some of them are just, well, why are we tied up? Uh, when they understand fully the, the, the reasons for this and other industries that are being damaged, uh, they'll be ahead of steam on to get out of the UK because they realise the, the UK has landed them in this situation. We can be in a different situation, be like the Irish fishermen, if you are out of the UK. The UK is the big limiter. Now, obviously, people are moans and complaints about this common fisheries policy, and yes, it wasn't perfect at all. But the situation where you can't land and sell any catch is probably the most abysmal uh, fishing situation you can have and this is what's happening at the moment so we are in that small area replicated in other areas we might have people that are very ready uh, to vote for independence in May um, and that we've just no mechanism of moving successful opinion polls into um, in, into ballot box success and remember I'll say again because I'm, I don't know I can, I can say this enough there is no guarantee at all in any way shape or form nobody can guarantee this now, we will have a referendum in the next Scottish Parliament. Section 30 isn't happening, and a Scottish Parliament held referendum could be derailed into courts or could have the knees chopped off from Westminster. So people really have to get that in their heads. There's one glimmer of hope, there's one thing to bank it, and that would be uh, to, in May, to show some leadership and say to the Scottish people, this will be the vote for independence directly. Because Boris Johnson, I was saying earlier, plan A is... A quick is to ask the is ask Boris a question. Can we go back and ask the people a question? So it's ask the people a question. Can we ask Boris a question? Come back and ask the people a question. Right. But plan B does it's a direct answer from the people on the sixth, seventh of May. Do you want to be independent? Answer yes or no. Vote for us, give us, and that is your independence coming the way. So people understand when they go to the polls. It certainly puts uh, Boris Johnson in a position because to refuse that and to say no to the people is very different to saying no to uh, uh and it's uh, a party in a devolved uh, yeah. parliament that's about 8% of your population saying they want a referendum. Mm, what about the, you just string them along as he's done, mostly. Um, he made a mistake probably in that interview by saying it wasn't going to happen in 2055. But to say no to the people at Plan B, that puts yourself in the bracket of Lukashenko. Or even, let's say, Donald Trump, who yeah. um, tried to deny the ballot box uh, and didn't get very far at all. You can't deny the ballot box once the people have spoken. Boris's trick, and it has to be, is to stop the people speaking. That's why he will not give a section 30, and that's why the UK government will do what they can to block uh, anything going through the Scottish Parliament. And it's why, um, unfortunately, it's got to be said, we, we're gambling at the moment. Will we get a referendum or not in the next Parliament? I, would, I wouldn't put money on it. And, 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 I think the odds are far too long. And, and also there's the, the real danger of, of if there isn't a, a plan B, that the SNP will hemorrhage support after that. that, that I mean, that's that's a real. I mean, I don't think people can go on for another parliament saying, "Oh yeah, we're the party of independence, and we'll get you a referendum" if they don't at least try. You know, this time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just looking at the chat there. And there's a good question coming from Kevin Camper Van Man Rolling, and he okay. says, "Is this a topic of discussion within the SNP?" It's mm, among the SNPs. I don't think it really is. But the SNP is quite a hierarchical organization. That you know, if if the if the top has a different view, then all, all the branches down below will have a different view. So, I mean, there's good reasons for that, uh, especially when we're a small party, uh, rather than being derailed by the press by doing split stories. Uh, but no, there's, it's not really a topic for discussion 
within SNP MPs that I'm aware of anyway, certainly, and none have really come to me, um, bar maybe two or three, I should be frank, maybe two or three. Uh, Kenny McCaskill would support it. Um, perhaps there's another few who are still not ready to put the names out there, but um, yeah, on the whole, no. I would say maybe four or five would probably are tops for plan B. Um, and, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> I was also the only Scottish MP to vote against uh, the election of 2019 as well, because then the the the, um, the the signal from the top of the tree was to do something different. Um, and I don't think, you know, we gained more MPs, but we certainly lost power and influence and it enabled Boris Johnson to do the general market bill and to do the Brexit he wanted, um, you know. Uh, but each to their own. I, I make my decisions and other MPs make their decisions. But the type of organisation the SNP is, that sometimes isn't the easiest, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and why do you think, what do you think is the ba base reason for this lack of enthusiasm? I know Joanna Cherry has, you know, said we got to at least consider other ideas. And I, 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 it's almost like there's some kind of bigger question behind it that's kind of preventing people from, you know, preventing us from, from even, from even talking. Yeah. About it. I mean, if, if I move away from the, the sort of the devil's advocate view that I gave just a few seconds ago, um, I think that, you know, our mentality has been a lot of the time is to circle the wagons. Um, and I think it's a circle of the wagons thing, you know, and particularly uh, protecting policy and protecting people in, in leadership positions especially um, has been, you know, there's a lot to be said for that as well. So uh, while I can be critical of what it means in this particular point for independence, you know, uh, it's it's good to, 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 to debate and to, to debate back. And I think maybe there's, people might come up with, with counter-arguments to what I've said, uh, and that's fine, you know, like, let's have a debate about it. But the thing is, as you know, with Plan B, we were thwarted from having a debate in 2019, we were thwarted again in 2020 for having a debate, uh, we're trying to have a debate at um, at National Assembly. But the argument that's going to be thrown at us is uh, it's too late to change now. You know, it's this at this point before the election. Um, so we will most likely go into the 2021 election with a manifesto that will have roughly the same ask for a referendum. We didn't specify Section 30 in the 2016. We just said we should have a referendum and we'll probably and have much know, the same. And do you know when the, manifesto, the SNP manifesto is supposed to come out for the main? It usually comes out quite late. It's, it's in the, officially it's under the authorship of Keith Brown um, and it'll usually come out probably if the election's in May, you'll probably see it come out in mid-April. Uh, sometimes there's a bit of an internal argument that he has to go out before the postal votes start. Um, uh, but it's traditionally been always quite late, uh, which has got his own issues. So, But, you know, it, it, the thing is, wh wh where Plan B really falls down is, is probably it's not being taken seriously within the Scottish government, at least for, for, for this election. But, you know, if we have another five years of, of Tories governing us, blighting lives, um, foisting economic policies on us we don't want and us railing against them and saying Scotland must be respected and Scotland's voice will be heard when Scotland is not being respected and Scotland's voice is not being heard. Um, as, is, as I say, paraphrasing Seamus Mallon, uh, pardon me if the SDLP delete Seamus Mallon, the 2026 uh, referendum uh, election will be the 2021 for slow learners uh, when we realise that the referendum routes are, are blocked. But all we've got to do is use the ballot boxes. I mean, ballot boxes turn up as far as I know in two guises. They turn up at elections and they turn up at referendums. Um, some people will say, why don't we just dissolve the union? Well, we can't. We've got to get the okay from the people. And if we don't find a mechanism, if we're refusing, if we're refusing to countenance uh, the elections and Boris is going to stop us using the referendums, then we're going nowhere fast. Um, so we'll at some point have to wisen up. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to turn the discussion now uh, before before getting on to the uh, more in more to the questions. Just kind of uh, we were speaking briefly before the before being on air about how once Scotland is achieved, that if it becomes just another oligarchy, it will be of a, a complete waste. I mean, we, there needs to be something you know much more wired into people's lives and, and something that is much more democratic. And I was I was evoking the example of the United States that was specifically designed to be an oligarchy, and 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 uh, you know with, with the with the ruling class running things. Uh, and so, how do what are your ideas on how Scotland could be different, and how we could you know how a 
governing system could be developed that would be much more democratic and accountable. Yeah, I mean, I do worry that sometimes in the Scottish psyche, there's we've been so long had the idea of landlords and uh, a sort of a class system and a feudal system around us and a forelock tugging almost, and you know that there are ideas of social betters and social worsers, if I can uh, make up a word like that. Um, and you know that uh, is that is that sometimes just a worldview that's very hard to shift. And you know, in Scotland, would we? All of us, from the top to the bottom, except for various slotting in in certain places. So I think that's something we should be aware of. Um, I think as we go forward, I mean, uh, I would. There are various choices in front of us. I mean, I think of, from the Nordic nations, you would say there's a general theme going through them, which is sort of um, a good social security nets, safety nets in society, um, a prosperous, fairly uh, low inequality. Uh, at the same time. Uh, you can see that uh, I think millionaires and billionaires per capita uh, are greater in the Nordic societies uh, than they are in the United States of America. Right? Um, so, but this they reckon is a function of a free education and a function of social mobility, enabling the talents to shift around in society. Uh, and the 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 percentile group that you're born in in the Nordic countries. Um, isn't necessarily the percentile group you'll end up when you die. Uh, however, in America, there's a very, there's a far stronger correlation uh, to it's going down. I mean, it, it, yeah, <laughs> it is. I mean, it, it, so it, you know, you've got those choices. You've kind of got the the other choice, which is maybe an Irish choice, which is you pay less taxes, but then you've got so much else to pay, and at the end of the day, you're probably paying much the same, except in the safety nets that aren't there for all. And the worst of it all, I would say, is America. Which oh, sorry, my phone. I'll just deal with that. Um, oh, I know, I've got a phone, it's later. It's a phone call from Ireland. Um, they were, um, you know, the worst of all is America, where you pay pretty low taxes, but to do anything else, you have to shell out for children's education. Oh, for, absolutely. Uh, I mean, for here, in France, our, here in France, our, our taxes are, are relatively high, but you don't really notice it. I mean, you know. No, and, no. Uh, hey, there, there was, there was quite, very quickly, you get what you yeah. pay for. I mean, I've, I've got excellent, you know, excellent medical care, the roads are well taken. You pay a lot for gas, but the roads are in good condition. The infrastructure is, uh, uh, you know, really, really good. And so you know where your taxes are going. And it good, yeah. You know, which and, is- and, 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 you know, and that one I often think is, so, so when Americans you see the pictures of their houses, they look absolutely beautiful inside. Uh, and if you could stretch the idea of the concept of the house and the furniture around about you, uh, your, your roadways are a mess. I mean, you might live in a castle, but it's, it's a tumble down outside, and what the sort of the French approach is the entire nation or the entire land is is part of my house. So let's let's look after it all. I mean, I've been to Brittany, we are there, Mark, and I've seen the the, the difference in approach uh, compared to compared to what I've seen in, in America, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's quite extreme. I was just going to tell you, there's, a, there's quite a wealthy man of, of new in the Nordic countries who's playing golf uh, with Americans, and they were they were mocking his taxes, which was about double as a percentage. But it, but they, compared to what they were paying. Then he asked them, how much are you paying for health? And that added up to a whole other, other percentage. How much are you paying for children's education? That added up to a whole lot else. How much do you need to save for your retirement? That added up to a whole lot else. And he basically said, he said, you guys have no security at all. Once you've earned money, you've got to save and store it. I can transact with my money because I know that when I have it, I can play with it. And I do so to buy more ships and to do this and to do, and to do the rest of it. So this is an extremely wealthy Nordic guy who was making the case for higher taxes. Uh, over and above the Americans, because he thought they they can never feel the security I feel because they don't know what calamities are going to come into their lives, and there's nobody else but themselves to help them. Whereas, you know, if somebody has a real peculiar illness in my family or extended family or my neighbourhood or whatever, we don't all have to rally around to help them. The, the, the safety net is there for them, or have fundraisers to pay for. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. The thing is, it's 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 it, Americans pay more taxes. It's just a a, a a relatively small percentage of, of taxes to the federal government, but much much more taxes to private corporations, whether it be in the form of health insurance or absolutely a good point. Of, a good way of expressing that actually, more taxes to private corporations and health insurance. And what else are you going to say? Sorry. Well, that's that, that, well, just a, a private corporations that that uh, performing functions, you know, uh, to ex, you know, ex, uh, you know, basically wring people dry. Uh, you know, pharmaceutical prices in the states are shocking. You can't, and 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 the efforts to stop people buying more cheaply 
uh, there's no much belief in market economics to buy cheaply from Canada uh, is much thwarted. Uh, and these are ill people. These are people who need their meds. They're, they're, they're actually ringing uh, out of, out of, the, out of the, those people, which is an awful shame. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and what do you and, and what do you see in terms of the the constitution in the UK, such as it is, unwritten, completely vague, uh, you know, make it up as they go along, basically. And what do you think should be codified in a Scottish constitution that is definitely not codified in the UK constitution, such as it is? I would think of, the, for example, individual rights, which are you know under most constitutions are guaranteed you know, whether it be negative or positive rights, uh, whereas in the UK, it's all based on statutes so that they can give a right or they can take it away just as easily, you know, in the next parliament and no parliament can bind the next, et cetera. So what do you think should be codified in a Scottish constitution that is not currently codified now in under the UK constitution? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. And, and, and given that the, we're, we're trying to get Scotland into the starting blocks, uh, there are people who've done a lot more thinking about this than me. I, mean, I saw that Iceland a number of years ago made a, a stab at a constitution through citizens' assemblies, but then the political class, well, who I get on quite well with in, in Iceland across political parties, decided not to adopt it. Uh, but, you know, I, th- I would leave that quite open to, to citizens. I don't want to be prescriptive about something like, something like that. But I think there are examples in, in, in con- the worst example you could have would be the American constitution. It makes me sort of go, oh, you know, you might have the right right for, for uh, bearing arms, as they say. Um, not up to nuclear weapons, of course, but, but certain, certain other arms you can bear. Um, and you can't bear them in, on aircraft either. And, but you can bear them in certain places. You can't bear them in Congress, apparently, but as we saw, luckily. Um, but, you know, I, there's, there's a whole other set of areas where, as you're saying, you know, you could, you could empower the individual and empower and, and enshrine rights in society that would be there in perpetuity, that then the balance between them getting, you know, re- reaching an absurd point the way the Americans have with their right to bear arms. But the other side of that is making sure... Uh, that you have uh, a structure where people maintain liberty and the state can't take it away. Um, again, of course, that requires further thinking because um, in a pandemic, we might all want to take away individual liberties <laughs> uh, from certain people as well, so from ourselves and others. So, you know. Well, um, I, I would also like to. It's, it's a minefield to get down that one. I'm, I'm, I'm not a constitution writer at all, as, as yet. If I could get Scotland to have the, op- the option to get near the right in its own constitution, I might uh, pay more attention to it. But the unfortunate thing for us is we're not near that at the moment. Well, look, there's no reason we can't write. I mean, I've, I've developed this constitutional website as well, and which has a, a written constitution, which is there to be adapted. Because the way I view it is in America, we tend to see constitutions as like it, it, it's like holy writ. You know, it was cut, sent down. That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. But that's but it's, but I, 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 I prefer to see constitutions as like software, as governing software. And it, just as you update your software on your phone or your computer, there's no reason that that that, that kind of system couldn't be adopted to. Is it, but but are you then getting close to the game of statute where you sort of pull rights away at, at certain points? I mean. Yeah. You've, you've, you've got a situation where you've got a constitution, but if, if the constitution is too fixed, it's difficult. If it's too fluid, it's difficult as well. And well, you, you got to get it just right. Right. You, you got to get it just right. And yeah. another thing is that you need to have it to a point where it's amendable without the way that, for example, in America, the, you know, they tacked on amendments to the to the to the, to the, the base text. And then the base text still has stuff from slavery. They still have remnants from, you know, I mean, as, as I said, it was, it was designed as an oligarchic thing. And they, they've, they've added ones, you know, the, elect, the Senate is elected, the president is elected by the, you know, the, the electoral college through the people rather than the state legislatures. It has been changed, but it's still the same. It's, it's like running your computer on Windows 1789. It just, obviously we see it just doesn't, you know, function anymore. And if it was able to be updated on a regular basis through a democratic process, it could find that find that golden mean between too rigid and too flexible. But I, I certainly, I certainly take your point, uh, your point well. But yeah, I mean, I think that as uh, an amusing story that uh, then I heard a number of years ago, on the 200th anniversary of the Norwegian Constitution, which that would date how many years ago it was. Um, um, say it was probably after the Napoleonic Wars, so 1815, say it was 1815, somewhere in between 2014 and 2016, a professor, Fjarstad, 
of the Oslo University gave a presentation at the Norwegian uh, Embassy or Ambassador's House in, in London, and he talked about the Norwegian constitution. It's something we're all very proud of, he says, as a shiny box. We don't really look at what's inside it too much because we wrote it 200 <laughs> years ago. Article 2 says, and I think this is a belter, no Jesuit priests, Jesuit priests, no, but, but particularly Jesuit priests, uh, shall be shall enter the kingdom of Norway, probably in pain of death or something. I'm not exactly what it was. But oh, <laughs> it's just quite amazing uh, today. So the Norwegians are kind of an approach to their constitution. They're very proud of it because it, it, it was just the point of view of establishing the idea that Norway was going to be a country. But now the details of it, uh, nowadays, according to this professor, oh, Charles Char- Char- Sarstad, were a little bit embarrassing, I think. I know. It, it's, it's funny yeah. also, of course, in the UK, you look back I mean, you look back on the English Bill of Rights of 1689. It said, we give these rights to everyone except papists. And then you and yeah. then, <laughs> and then in the, in, even in the in the Treaty of Union in, in 1707, you know, they talk a lot about salt and I mean, it's all weird stuff that, that it's actually. Yeah. In there. But but, but at, at the same time, they, you know, what they were obsessed with was not having a Catholic achieve the throne. So you have, you know, the papist, the word papist is littered throughout the Treaty of Union. It's it's just insane. And uh, yeah, and, and that's actually still a thing. I mean, I think if it came to the situation today, it would. I'm certain it would change, but <laughs> uh, as it's written at the moment, it's not. And you know, some people are rightly or wrongly vexed by it. I'm not very vexed by it at all. But um, and I'm Catholic, so I can kind of say, uh, by my 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 pretensions to be to be king of anywhere are, are absolutely zero. So I'm, it doesn't bother me. At all. <laughs> You're not too bothered then. Okay. Well, let's let's go ahead and turn into some of the questions. We're going back. Yeah. To- good. Uh, why don't you just scroll to the top and then just go through the questions on your own and see yeah. No way. Yeah. Could do. I'll see if I can. Um, I know SNP members, uh, this is from Jules Murray, SNP members have been written to, but it looks like lockdown could be with us for some time. How do we get the general independence population registered for postal votes? How do we keep them out of Ruth's hands? Oh, good question. Um, I suppose we've just got to uh, write to them and get them on the electoral roll. I mean, think that's been happening, but it's certainly not going round door to door. Um, oh, Faye Kenny, what about the medicine? I'm really worried about that. I'm taking it. This is about Brexit. Uh, and the difficulties of transporting medicines here. Yeah, that is a problem. I think there have been some people have been told they're not getting medicines from the Netherlands in particular because of the Brexit. Uh, you know, I'm dealing with fishermen at the moment who are like asking stuff and why, when will this paperwork be, be sorted? And the reality is it, it won't be sorted. You're going to have to get better at doing the paperwork. And it's a hard message to give. Um, and the UK government should be doing what it can because this is an import. Uh, but the, the fishing stuffs are exports, and th- therefore their imports the European Union have control of that. But you would imagine that this must be to do with the difficulty they have of getting the stuff from the Netherlands, and there's, there's messages coming in probably uh, dealing with that. Um, but I have read a little bit about it, and it should be something the UK government should prioritise. Question, 18 polls in a row for yes. Do you think there'll be an independence vote this year? No. No, there won't. Um, I don't. I'm saying this directly to the camera. I just. I don't think. I'm just trying to. I don't know if there'll be an independence vote before t- a referendum before 2026. Nobody can guarantee it. Absolutely nobody at any level of the Scottish government right now can guarantee you that there will be an independence referendum, Robert Wilson, in the next Scottish Parliament. That, I, I can't say that enough to people. This is not a guarantee. This is why I would use the ballot boxes that you are guaranteed is going to be occurring in May. Who's going to be the new Scottish Labour leader and who wants the job? Somebody said today, Campbell Gunn said on Twitter, there was once upon a time that used to be big news, uh, whoever was leading the Labour <laughs> Party. It's not anymore. Um, what do we hope to have uh, for the US to drop 25% duty on whiskey when it was part of a dispute between the USA and the EU? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's wider than that. It's probably, uh, there are Airbus um, situations uh, between the UK and uh, Europe together, and that was, I think, the trigger for this. And the the Trump government, or the Trump administration, as they call it, uh, was keener on this sort of trade wars and tariffs. Hopefully, the Biden uh, situation is a bit different. Although you would imagine that Biden, uh, sorry, you'd imagine that Trump would have uh, given his mate Boris a little bit of a help, but he didn't. Um, does Biden want to help? Maybe he wants to help Scotland, but does he want to help the UK? Um, I don't know. What's what are the UK press not reporting on? What why are the UK press not reporting what's really going on? I would say the trade is the big thing. They're not reporting on enough of what's going on. 
Um, the, it's, fishing is coming to the fore, but uh, too much has been uh, lost or too much has not been explained to people. And even within fishing, folk are thinking it's paperwork that can be sorted like normal uh, UK uh, issue. Uh, internal issues can be sorted. This isn't an internal issue. Irish Times says a 4% loss of their GDP in a post-Brexit deal. Okay, so that's quite high. It's higher than expected in Ireland. Um, but they will have work around their GDP is of course higher, and it is in both cases. Um, is, sorry, their GDP is higher, and they are mitigating that um, through the um, direct routes to France. But yeah, it will. It will G- be GDP, lost. Per, sorry, GDP per capita. Yeah, sorry, absolutely. Yeah, 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 thank you for that, Mark. Yeah, that was a yeah. misspoke. Yeah, I was thinking per capita, but definitely not the GDP of the five million of Ireland is not higher than the GDP of the 66 million of the UK or the one billion of China or the 890 million of India. But the GDP per capita of Ireland is higher than the four of those uh, nations. Uh, the SNP have shown no interest in working with any other parties. They would have plebiscite work. Yeah I, th- yeah, yeah, I mean, I think you would have to be quite clear and say that you wouldn't need to do much work with any parties. You would just have to say, <clears throat> if a majority of uh, pro-independence MSPs are elected, then that would be your mandate. And other parties to have the same line in in their manifesto um, and to, to make it happen. So you wouldn't need a lot of work, but you need to take the concept seriously. And as I'm saying, the concept doesn't look to be taken seriously at all. For this election, it will be, will be if nothing happens as... I predict it won't. Um, it'll be the series one for the 2026 election. But, you know, that's a long time. A long, long time. It's five years is 10 percent. I'm 50. It'll be another 10 percent of my life uh, wasted. Uh, Jim McIntyre, I'm well done for the Martin Keating section 30 affidavit. Yeah, I would just like to see will the Martin Keating thing work or not. You know, is he is he going to get there? Isn't, does the Scottish Parliament have the powers or doesn't it? I suspect it doesn't. Um, and it'd be good to find out one way or the other. So, Martin Keating says tenacious and let's find out. Uh, but okay. if we found out by the 31st of March. Do you think that a, a negative decision would be, uh, for example, if they did rule that they don't have the power, would that be a major setback or would it make any, would it just make no difference because that was the thinking all along? Well, yeah, the, the, the arguments probably each way on that. The way I would see it is I would just take that as the parliament doesn't have the power for that. So now we know the section 30 ain't happening. We know the parliament doesn't have the power. What are you going to do? You're going to have to use the elections as a plebiscite. Then you would use the May thing. So let's let's establish. What's probably going to do is we're going to be in the other one. Well, they, they'll be pursued if Westminster doesn't chop its knees off uh, and take and take uh, and ensure that power isn't there. It would be an easy decision for the courts to make then. Um, so it, this is work that should have happened in the last four years for goodness sakes. We should have known. That if we want to hold a referendum, we should have established this. Well, you know, I, I'll, I better not say too much about that. I'll get into too much party trouble if I do. It's difficult, you know, it, it, it is. Uh, did the Scottish government do enough during Brexit negotiations? Seems Ireland dug their heels in and to get everything they wanted, especially in the EU. Well, well they remember. Yeah, I mean, I'll defend the Scottish government here. The Scottish government had a real government, to be honest, they're governing. In a devolved country, the Irish government are, are now got the representatives of the UN Security Council for the next few years. Uh, they're, they're taking a rotation on that. They are a part of a member state of the European Union, and they had an equal voice at the top table. There is no top table in the UK. Um, we're, we're, we're probably nowhere really more ahead of, probably a little ahead of Manchester City Council or something like that. But, uh, the UK... It goes back to the point of Neil Richmond earlier I was making about fishing. They've seen consistent solidarity from the EU as Ireland. There is no such concept of any sort of solidarity uh, for, for nations of the UK from, from the centre. Uh, the idea that, that the fact that it is centralised is the most centralised union uh, that there is in Europe. And certainly it's not the European Union when you can see the, the autonomy, well, it's not autonomy, it's independence that Ireland has and the potential of vetoes that, I, that Ireland has. Um, if the SNP don't go for a plebiscite in May, what don't go for a plebiscite for May? What can we do to ensure this gets done? Um, if they don't go for a plebiscite in May, we're pretty knackered. Um, 2026. Sorry, you know, I just can't say this enough. This is um, the section 30 is not happening. I'll repeat it again. Section 30 is not happening. The referendum by the Scottish Parliament itself is unlikely. 
it'll be challenged and the vice president might pull the knees away from it, chop his knees off. It ain't gonna ha- it's very, very unlikely to happen. Nobody can say for certain it's going to happen. I wouldn't bet on it. So what can we do? Wait for the next election. Um, Angus says, plan B, the do- uh, I'll answer that one. Um, what do we do to get the SNP to go for this? Uh, remove the stubbornness, Gene. <laughs> don't know. Wave a magic wand. <laughs> oh, wave, a, wave a magic wand. I mean, good cop, bad cop. Uh, you know, the wailing and gnashing of teeth when Boris says no in July. Uh, he wasn't going to grind him down. I mean, Peter Wishart and my colleague said they would grind him down, you know, yesterday in the beginning of the grinding down. I, I interviewed him five. about that. I interviewed him and he, he kept maintaining that, but I was, I just, I, I wasn't convinced. I mean, great guy, Peter, but I, yeah, I just, you, you, know, you might have seen the, the liaison committee yesterday when Peter tried to ask him yesterday for a referendum and he's, no. I mean, he's got the power and the authority, Boris. Why is Boris going to worry about 8% of his population, which is what Scotland is? And just what fifty-seven percent of that eight want uh, independence, which is about maybe five five percent of the UK population is total. That Boris's population, ninety-five percent of it, it's not an issue. And Boris is going to get about forty-eight percent of the votes anyway. So, pleasing this five percent is nowhere in Boris's agenda at all. Um, so yeah, we ain't going to grind them down, and we will be waiting for twenty twenty-six. Um, it annoys me sometimes when I. When I wake up in the morning, that fact, uh, especially when I realise it more days than others. Uh, but, you know, there's only so much you can really do. It's same with the December election. You know, you, can only, you can take a horse to water, etc. Uh, I agree with Angus. The polls don't guarantee any referendum after the next election. So does Angus support a plebiscite? Yes, definitely support a plebiscite, plebiscite election. Use the, any ballot box that we can. The referendum will be blocked. As my, the secretary will be blocked, as I said. I'll say it again. Scottish Parliament one is likely to be blocked. The only thing is we're going to have that give us an offer internationally recognised legal are elections. So use the elections then. How can we put pressure on the best way forward? Uh, email them. Email them and say support support um, the ballot boxes. Uh, who will be the next Labour leader in Scotland? I think, I think we dealt with that. There's that once <laughs> time. How do we pressure the FM SNP into in plan B, yeah, email and email Keith Brown as well. He's the guy who's doing the uh, National Assembly. He's the guy who's um, who will be doing the manifesto. It's all pretty disheartening and thoroughly frustrating. It feels bleak. What can we do? What can the sovereign people of Scotland do, Angus? Yeah, we've got to, we've got to wait for a ballot box opportunity that's going to ask us, do we want to be independent? And that's what it's, I'm trying to get on the ballot box from our side in May. Um, so my arguments are internal. Why is the Party of Independence not speaking about independence? So you're not the Party of Independence. Note we think Darren McDonald is a unionist. I'm not sure who Darren McDonald is. Should I know? I'm moving swiftly on. Um, <laughs> Angus, do you think the fishermen are going to dump the rotten fish at Westminster? <laughs> uh, the, that's the thing with the chaos. <laughs> it, it, it's a whole lot of paperwork that's required uh, and there's people who required for each and every load. And I was in my local fish factory a while ago, and they were saying they're going to need uh, paperwork for each and every customer. So if they're sending, say, a ton of scallops, uh, fresh scallops that are going to go to 10 customers, they'll need a whole pile of paperwork, but also 10 individual bits of paperwork. So it's not just for the borders, but it's for the customers getting them too. So it's a mountain of paperwork they have to do. I think I've got one of their cards here. I mean, yeah, they've got... Export customs clearance, loading on trucks, carriage to the point of export, freight to port of import, carriage framed next place, the insurance, import custom clearance documents, the import duties, the import of VAT, and on and on and on it goes in, in, in this document. Uh, not just, sure. just, very quick, just very quickly, it is nine o'clock, but you go on as long as you want. So uh, It is nine, nine o'clock. Oh, okay, so we're at eight now, uh, eight, nine o'clock your time. So oh, sorry, excuse me, yes. We'll, yes, we'll yes, just, yes we'll, as, as you like, you know. Yeah, as I'll probably come to come to an end an end quite quickly. Um, sorry for the question came in late, Angus. I'm disheartened to say the least. Yes, and being not from the public of issues, you've have tripped us up in issues that have tripped us up in 2014. You feel we could be doing more. Well, I, I mean, 
I suppose, I, you know, I don't mean to dishearten people. I just mean to tell them the truth as I understand it. You know, hopefully I'm wrong. It'd be great if I'm wrong and, and Boris either changes his mind or it's legally possible to, and nobody will oppose it and the parliament will do it and we'll have a referendum. But what, what I see things and what I know at the moment, Boris ain't going to give us a section 30. He's been no, 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 in all the times we've asked. I can't see the referendum happening in the parliament um, at all. I think Martin Keating's effort if it gets an answer, it'd be good either way. So we could maybe then pressure for a May change uh, that we use those, those ballot boxes. But so very quickly, do you know how quickly the decision is supposed to be rendered? I don't uh, know. I think that there's all sorts of issues in that. I think one of the things myself and Kenny McCaskill were trying to do was to try and, and get a decision on that rather than thing being, being thrown out. Because the, the thing I want to do is find out the answer before the election. Because if you have the information now, you then taper. And this is what we should have done in 2019. When we asked for the Section 30, we should have asked before the election for the Section 30, got the answer. And then when we knew it was going to be the no, we knew we predicted the predictable and predicted no. We could then have not wasted the 2019 election ask to get the inevitable no answer and then do nothing about it. You know, I said uh, to somebody that would put her tail between her legs and got uh, very annoyed about that phrase. But effectively, nothing really much happened after after the January no uh, from them. Uh, you know, this, we've got about 100 odd elected uh, parliamentarians and a whole pile of elected councillors. So there's the capacity for these things to be pursued uh, if the authority is given to them. Okay. Anyway, it's not, and quickly, we are where we are. Uh, Mark, could you please just give the web address of the suggested method of alternate into India? Yes, it's uh, digitalconstitution.scot, D I G I T L uh, T A L constitution. Uh, sorry, no, no, excuse me. Digitalcovenant.scot, excuse me, digitalcovenant.scot is the is the address for the um, for, 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 for dot scot. I'm not with that too because I should have done that. It's, it's that. actually a, you know it's it's a it's a modest rephrasing of the original covenant that was that was the, of, over which two million people signed uh, in the early 1950s, but was subsequently ignored by Westminster, which were unverifiable signatures, uh, and this is, these are completely verifiable signatures that could easily clearly demonstrate and, and we're being very methodical about who you know about verification we only have a limited number of verification i think we've had maybe i don't know i haven't checked the stats recently but around 10,000 people have signed it but we've uh, but but we've had to we had to throw out a lot of it because they they didn't uh, so it's not just a it's it, it, just to say it's not just an online petition it's it's very methodically verified uh, but the the problem is we don't have uh, anything institutionally behind us to to have it as the means of independence, and therefore, and, and no, and vi virtually no publicity, and therefore, uh, you know, it's it it hasn't obviously we haven't you know secured as many signatures, but we as we do. But in, uh, just to plug it again, it is ideal because it can be done online during a pandemic. We don't have to people going 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 out, you know, voting and possibly catching COVID. Uh, and uh, it, it is a it is a certainly a legal way to achieve independence if it is taken on board by the powers that be. So anyway, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll just maybe finish up on the on the question of what will the SNP view of the Martin case, Martin Keating case wins. Um, it's probably too late in the day. Um, you know, we're we're back into the into the next parliament. Um, does that show it would it would have probably. We put pressure on to do that referendum ourselves and to hope Westminster don't chop the legs from under it. So there might be a downside of doing it in that um, we find that we find the answer and we find Westminster ch changes the, the rules. But I think Westminster is going to change the rules anyway if we come to it. That's why I don't think the referendum is going to be happening. They're not going to give, they're certainly not going to give a section 30. You know, that, that's, that's a piece of bluff poetry and pant pantomime that we should all drop. Uh, <laughs> that isn't happening. That's what... We'll end up kidding ourselves if we're not kidding other people with that kind of carry on if we're talking about that. Um, we, should, we should know that isn't going to happen uh, and we should tell people it isn't going to happen. So that leaves us with the long shot of our own referendum. Um, therefore, we should be using the ballot boxes at the elections. But I think I've said that about 10 times. Hopefully, I've got the message over that if you're asking me, does a referendum happen in the next Scottish Parliament? No. Um, okay. And therefore, we wait for the ballot boxes when the ballot boxes 
uh, an ex-presidente to us at an election, which is the most legal and internationally recognized event that would happen in any country. Uh, country. Let, let, me, let, let me just end by uh, playing a little bit of the devil's advocate. Go on. I, I, read, I, read, an, I read something, you know, I, I think it was in The National that, that uh, Mike Russell had told the Austra- some uh, Australian officials that he wants an independence referendum this year. I have seen in the plans for the uh, Scottish Investment Bank, I believe, that, that was uh, that, that, they, that they have a, a very precise timeline that I think it's going to be, I think it's the 27th of September that, they, that they've that they said that they will hold the referendum. So I may, maybe there's some plans that we don't know about yet that will become manifest in the next few weeks. I, I'm sure you would love that if that happened and you were proved wrong. So absolutely, you know, not, to, not, not to contradict you in any way. No, no, perform. please. I would love to be contradicted and proven wrong. Uh, you know, it's, but there, there, I have seen evidence that their their plans are afoot. Uh, you know, I mean, just yeah, in terms yeah. of crap. But presumably, let me just I just finish. Presumably, they can't just blast it out right now just because of the Brexit situation. But maybe, just maybe, when the, the manifesto is 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 approved and, and released, albeit late. That um, that there could be that, that, that they will say we're going to have a referendum if if the, if the UK government wants to stop try to stop us let them go it but we're going to do it so maybe you know uh, but uh, thanks for the information about Keith Brown and that being the principal architect and I'll try yeah. to get him on the show in the coming uh, the coming yeah months. I mean I, th- I think I think the answer to that I saw that story when Michael Russell was talking to uh, George Brandis the the Australian ambassador I mean. I, I, it's only good he's got, he's got a plan that he mentions the Australian ambassador. I mean, he could have mentioned it to him when somebody at a bus stop or, you know, what does it mean when you've told the Australian ambassador? No, it's a, pl- a plan. It's just a plan. But can you get the plan anywhere? That's that's the difficulty. Um, you know, and and I, and I just want to sort of level what that plan is. It's no more than a plan. You have loads of plans, but is the plan feasible? Uh, there's no guarantee that plan will go anywhere. There's absolutely no guarantee that that plan will get to the discussion parliament. Nobody can guarantee and nobody in the Scottish government can guarantee that that plan uh, can be delivered. And that's the problem. They cannot guarantee it. I know I've, I've got loads of plans. <laughs> I've got a plan for using the May election, but I know, I'm fairly certain that the way it's going, that ain't going to happen. So probably the best laid plans of Angus McNeil and Michael Russell will go and gang off to Glee, uh, or as some other people say, the best laid plans of mice and men are just about equal. Yeah. Sorry, I must be awfully pessimistic. Sorry, I don't mean yeah, to be. Good. Need, you know, people need the dose of reality of it, and 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 if it, yeah, and I if think it, that's what I'm trying to I'm trying to provide that dose of reality. And, to and, and if, it, if it only and if it only makes people more determined to pressure their their elected representatives, I mean, that's all for the better. I I think you know it's 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 very important. I think it is very important to have this dose of reality and what the possible roots are and what the impediments are from someone like you who's completely on the front line. Of, yeah, of, I mean. Uh, on, on the 4th of July 2018, I asked, I've put it on Twitter tonight, I asked Theresa May a question about the selling of shellfish uh, to the European markets. Uh, and she thought it was something about the CFP and uh, that uh, the SNP did all wrong in the CFP. But she didn't get the, you know, this was on the catching. This was one who was on the boat and they needed to be sold. Uh, yeah. She didn't get that point at all. I warned against the election uh, in 2019 it would be a mistake and give Boris a, a majority and it would kill everything they were trying to do with Brexit, and that came to be. I'd rather do the warnings just now about um, about what I see happening, rather than let everybody have the cold realisation later. When you've been warned, there's a possibility to do something about it. Afterwards, yeah. once it, Boris Johnson exactly. has signed the deal and you have the paperwork, your boats are tied up, it's now very difficult to do something about it, and it might be very difficult to do something uh, about our situation until 2026 or maybe the UK election before then. Um, well, to end on to end on a positive note, Faye Kennedy says, uh, "Angus, we more meet, we need more like you." So uh, that's uh, <laughs> well. Thank you very much, Faye. If that's, if that's uh, that is a positive note. Positive thing I'll, I'll hold on to that. Delighted. So uh, anyway, okay. Well, um, sorry. Uh, the, the last one, uh, Chang Minor Angus. Thank uh, God. Thank God, news. Yeah. Um, um, what is that? Uh, translate. Uh, it's a uh, big thanks, Angus. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, right. On that, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> thank you thanks th- thanks again well, thank you Mark. thanks you again i'll have you back you know come back anytime you know so uh, well hopefully and, hopefully, and, hopefully and, we, do, we don't need the likes of independence radio in, in a year or two so i have no disrespect to you but it would have been achieved 
Uh, but I've got a feeling we'll be back discussing, unfortunately. But you know, you're doing it. You're doing a great job, and well, well done for doing it. Thank you, and and I and I know uh, I know we both hope hope you're wrong. So uh, yeah. yeah, okay. So, cheers, all, right. all the best. All right, you too. Thank you, Van. Never miss a live stream. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows now has its own website. You can find the guide at whatsonguide.scot, independencelive.net, or on multiple Facebook pages. Do you create your own live stream events and shows? Get them registered on the guide. See whatsonguide.scot for full details. This is a new voice for a new Scotland. We know you're busy people, so most of our shows are also on demand on our Scottish Independence podcast channel, available wherever you get your podcasts. You'll see what a great variety of shows we have. There's something for everyone. Our newest on-demand platform is Indie Live Radio's YouTube channel. We have set up playlists for our most popular shows and current topics, currency, disc parties. New content is added almost daily, so subscribe and you won't miss anything. Join us. Thanks for listening. It's not acceptable to say we just keep on trying and we have another mandate and we can have another mandate and we keep on trying. You've got to make a political judgment that it's not going to work and say, well, in that case, we have either got to admit that we're not going to go for independence, and this is where I think the government has not been honest with people. That is, I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just saying that it is at least a possibility. If we hone in totally on Section 30, we could not get a referendum at all 
um, under Section 30. And therefore, that to me means that you've got to find another way. But I don't think anybody who has gone over to yes now is really for moving because I think they can see clear as day what things look like. And I always felt that during the independence referendum that it would take a no vote in order for a lot of Scots to realise the consequences of voting no. They would have to see what happens when they vote no in order to realise what a mistake it was. And to me, that's the clear blue water between staying in the UK and going for independence. It's clear, regardless of what Boris Johnson said the other day, that they will want to go back to business as usual, where the ultra-rich are the ones who gain from everything. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be part of that. We want the chance to actually build a fairer country. It's the Brexit stuff for me, the nepotism stuff for me, breaking international law stuff for me, the ERG hijacking UK democracy stuff for me, education is a luxury stuff for me, £9,000 tuition a year stuff for me, it's the NHS on the table for US trade deal stuff for me, demonising the working classes stuff for me, refusing starving children free school meals stuff for me, it's Boris calling Muslim women letterboxes stuff for me, his picking any's comments stuff for me, his bum boys comments stuff for me, his Scotland as a verminous race comments stuff for me, the UK internal market bill ripping up the devolution settlement stuff for me, devolved legislators being ignored during Brexit stuff for me, a lack of UK leadership during Covid stuff for me, nuclear weapons being in Scotland stuff for me, a decade of Tory government Scotland didn't elect stuff for me, it's a weak left opposition in England stuff for me, attempting to frame independence as anti-English bigotry stuff for me, it's trying to ban anti-capitalist references in schools stuff for me, it's England-centric lefties painting SNP as a protest vote even though Scottish Labour is spineless stuff for me, it's the UK for me. Hi there, I'm, I'm Cliff. And I'm Russ. And I'm from, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a programme out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot. Never miss a live stream. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows now has its own website. You can find the guide at whatsonguide.scot, independencelive.net or on multiple Facebook pages. Do you create your own live stream events and shows? Get them registered on the guide. See whatsonguide.scot for full details. Dawn had broken as dreams
dreams and hopes they shattered. We're gathering as Alpha's future led us. Sing freedom's anthems, small nations join together. We shall be heard, our chains released forever. Traitors was surprising. You showed the way and gave us inspiration. The seeds are sown to once more be a nation. It's a song I wrote about five minutes ago called Carpe Diem, Hope Over Fear. Are you threatened by words from an empire of money and gold? Will you chain in your country's potential for the lies you've been sold? Are you scared that the walls are too high to be breached by the bold? Will you stand and be counted or shut up and do what you're told? Hope over fear, don't be afraid. Tell Westminster Tories that Scotland's no longer your slave. Carpe diem, will you seize the day? Rip the chains 
from the unicorn, Scotland's no longer your slave. Then the TV man call you a nationalist for rejecting the lies. Ha! All the wolves of the few off the bob, cause he wears shots and ties. When they tell you that Scotland's no great, are you really surprised? Will you stand and be counted for something that money can't buy? Hope over fear, don't be afraid. Tell Westminster Tories that Scotland's no longer your slave. Carpe diem, will you seize the day? Rip the chains from the unicorn, Scotland's no longer your slave. Dumped on the climb Fighting wars for the wealth of the few How many have died? You can bury my bones But the truth of it can't be denied Will you stand and be counted Cos I'll be there stood by your side Hope over fear don't be afraid The Westminster Tories The Scotland's no longer your slave Carpe diem Will you seize the day Rip the chains from the unicorn Scotland's no longer your slave Will the media tell you that England don't want you to go And the taxpayer funded MPs Tell you just tell them no No But in Manchester, Nottingham, Sheffield They already know That they're fighting for them And it's only the start of the show Ha <laughs> ha Hope over peace Tell Westminster Tories that Scotland's no longer your slave. Carpe diem, my friend, will you seize the day? With the change from the unicorn, Scotland's no longer your slave. Oh yes, for a future. Ha <laughs> ha!